Uh, we are delighted to have you with us uh, for this really consequential topic on America's dangerous border and how we can protect Texas and our country from the drug cartels and human trafficking and everything that has to do with the border security issue. Um, we are joined by two distinguished champions of, of doing this issue right in terms of border security, and that's Sheriff A.J. Lauterbach from Jackson County, who's been an absolute champion uh, over the years for federal and local cooperation in, in actually uh, having our laws executed. Uh, and also, as Jackson County Sheriff's, he's really led the charge on U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement Cooperation, the 287G program, which we'll be talking about, the impact of that, how that's grown, and what a difference it makes, and how things are looking going forward. Um, he's also been chairman of the Regional Homeland Security Advisory Committee, uh, and he's uh, on Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's Law Enforcement Advisory Committee. Uh, we also have with us former ICE Director Tom Holman, who's currently a consultant in Homeland Strategic Con Consulting. He was appointed by President Trump in 2017 uh, as Acting Director of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He previously served as Executive Associate Director of ICE Enforcement and Removal Operations, 33-year veteran of law enforcement, has nearly 34 years of immigration enforcement experience, including here in Texas extensively. So um, we really couldn't have a better panel in terms of federal and local expertise on this subject. We're missing State Representative Matt Schaefer for a good reason. He has a vote this afternoon, so won't be able to join us. It's also very possible due to an emergency uh, that the sheriff will have to leave early and we'll have one of our internal experts on border security come and join us uh, to talk about what we're doing on the issue at TPPF and some of the issues that are very hot going forward. So here at TPPF, as you well know, we try to be optimistic. Uh, so I'm gonna try to start with something that maybe uh, we can look at the best possible scenario going forward. We just, uh, we're on the brink, right, of a tremendous change in administration in Washington uh, where we've had a lot of progress on border security and now we're, facing a change where we have an administration that's promised to reverse a lot of these policies that have been working. So, and yet at the same time, I'm wondering, and I'll direct this to Sheriff uh, first and Tom to come in, but we're seeing some indications all of a sudden from the president-elect beginning as recently as of two days before Christmas that he said, and I quote, the last thing we need is to say we're going to stop immediately the access to asylum the way it's been run now, meaning to say the way the Trump administration has been running it. And he says, and we end up, end up with two million people on our border. So Sheriff and, and Tom, is, what would be the best scenario? Is it, why, is, why is the vice president and former vice president and the president-elect walking back now some of these commitments? Well, Ken, thank you. And thank the uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation for hosting this and inviting us uh, here for a very important subject here. Uh, in the United States, uh, because no portion of this does not affect each and every county in Texas and counties throughout the United States. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. The, um, uh, I, when, I, when I heard and read that uh, our incoming president had um, declared that we need to take a, take a step back and look at our border situation to avoid a, a rush, which is clearly, clearly uh, pending, uh, currently, there's quite a bit of information about that, but the um, the, the story behind the, the situation may be uh, directly linked to COVID. Um, many countries, uh, Mexico and South America, have uh, figured out that now our borders are important. And so, um, you know, I appreciate uh, our incoming president's comments about that, but it very well could be uh, that the cooperation agreements between the different countries are affecting the actual flow of folks because we actually have Guatemala and El Salvador that are stopping and restricting in Mexico, stopping and restricting at the borders. So we're not having uh, a lot of what we used to have um, back in previous years prior to the Trump administration, which I'll, uh, I will say that during this, this time with the Trump administration that we have been well supported in some very very significant 
um, actions have been taken by the Trump administration to, to uh, curb the flow. And from my perspective, uh, this is about crime. It's about crime and criminality and the effect that it has in the, t in the, in the negative outcomes that we have in the state of Texas. Uh, in my region, headed to the number one human trafficking capital in the U.S. or Texas, the hub of, of Houston, Texas. So these are areas that uh, are very important to me. I'm very passionate about that. But uh, President Trump has done, a, has done a tremendous job in that respect. And there are many folks, including myself, who have some concerns about, uh, about what the future holds for us. Tom, what would you say about these actions by the president-elect walking back some of well, I like to think he's walking back because he's here, listening to me on Fox News for the last six months saying we lose the border <laughs> under Biden presidency. And, and I don't say that lightly. Look, I've, I've, I've been enforcing immigration law for 34 years. I started as a Border Patrol agent, so I wore that uniform. I've been there. And I've been involved in this for a long time. I, I've worked for six different presidents. But when you, when, when, when you put on your campaign site and your campaign speeches that you are going to end the Remain in Mexico program, uh, which is a good idea because Nine out of ten Central Americans who claim fear at the border never get relief from U.S. courts because they simply don't qualify. But they find a loophole to get released to the United States. So when you end that, when you say you're going to end ICE private detention, so you won't be detained, when you, said, when you say you're going to put a moratorium on deportation in the first hundred days, when you say you support sanctuary cities and, and what they do, when you say that uh, you're not going to allow ICE to do any work site, investigate, it, it work site operations anymore, which means you can work here illegally and you're never going to be found because ICE won't go to those work sites. And on top of all that, when you say, and on top of that, I'm going to give you free health care. When you, when you throw that type of enticements out to the world, you basically say you can enter this country illegally, you won't be detained, you won't be deported, you get free health care, you go to Sanctuary City, ICE will never be able to arrest you. They're going to come because, look, we're the greatest country on earth. I've said that, you know, we're the greatest country on earth, and I can't blame anybody that wants to try to get to the greatest country on earth. But you can't respect the country and enter illegally. You can't have it both ways. So I think President Trump's been very successful. Uh, the illegal immigration was at a historic low, unprecedented low, uh, with zero help from Congress. He did this on his own. Like him or love him, you can't argue the data. But if you look at the data now, and I've called it the Biden effect, once, once it was forecast that he was going to be the president, numbers last month were 82% increase from the same month last year, attempted entries. Now, most of them are being returned to Mexico under the Title 42 COVID restriction, but he's promised to lift that too down the road. But walking back now, it's too little too late. They're already coming. The last intelligence report I saw was like 23,000 already get, uh, staged up on the border. Caravans already uh, started up. The, the, the cartel's already developing a new transportation routes where there's not a wall. So it's coming. It's coming, it's gonna come hard, it's gonna come fast, if he keeps the promises he's made. Sheriff and, and Tom, I think we should take a moment to talk about President Trump and what he's done uh, just a, less than a week before this change. Uh, you were just with him, both of you. Uh, tell us about that. That wasn't covered very much in the news, and that's no surprise. But uh, tell us about your experience working with him these past four years. He gets it. He talks to the experts. When his, his whole idea of the border wall wasn't his idea. He talked to the experts. What do you need? I was a board police. We've been asking for a barrier for years. Barriers work. And when, once he understood the data, he looked at the data, every place a border barrier has been built, every place, 100% of the time, has resulted in decreased illegal immigration and decreased drug flow. They work. Not only do they work stemming the flow of illegal aliens and illegal drug flow, it saves lives. Uh, and, and, but what's different about this president, I've worked for six months, he, he has talked to the experts. I've been retired for two years. He still calls me. I was with him Monday and Tuesday this week. I went down, he asked me to go down to the wall where they we just finished the, uh, the 450 miles of wall. And, you know, and he, he, he's constantly trying to learn. So he's constantly talking to the experts. I, I've made many border trips with him. He doesn't talk to the chief. He goes straight to the GS5 board so he stands on the line. What do you need? What isn't working? What, what do you think the wall should look like? The wall was designed by the men and women of CBP. You know, you got, you got that, that, that panel on the top, the anti clam panel. He didn't even like that. He didn't want that. But once he heard from the men in Border Patrol that we need that panel up there, he, he, he said, okay, we'll do it. So he listens to the experts, the ones who have a lot of experience on the border, and he takes that to heart, and he goes back to the White House, and he makes it happen. So, you know, 
again, the president has done, and I've said this many times on Fox News, and I get hate from some people, I don't care because they don't know, but this president's done more to secure the southern border than any president I've worked for. And that's just a fact. If you look at the data and his successes, the numbers prior to him and the numbers after he got in, is success. He has the most secure border in my lifetime. And I, and I was hoping that uh, President Joe Biden would come in and say, okay, well, this is great success. Let me build upon that success. Let's finally have a secure border. Then we can talk about amnesty, talk about immigration reform, because we've always addressed what everybody, what every conservative says, let's, let's border enforcement first, secure the border, and let's talk about what we're going to do with those here. And all that. It, I was hoping Joe Biden would come in and do that, but it's obvious he's going to go the opposite direction. But President Trump is, is, a, is, is, is a president of the people. He built the Border Patrol what he needed, what the Border Patrol asked for. So you got, you got, to, hand, you got to give him credit that he listens to the, the people on the ground. Sheriff, you were also next to the president, welcoming him. In, welcoming him. Uh, can you tell us about that? You've been in the Oval Office and various meetings. Yes, my time uh, with President Trump uh, is, is, kind of comes down to one key word, uh, and that's a, is a tremendous listener. Um, you know, the man uh, possessed the ability to, to not say a word, ask questions, and um, take your answers uh, and, and take the notes about it with his staff there. And in his engagement with local law enforcement is legendary on the things that we never had before. So we, we were never able to accomplish the things of partnerships. Um, it takes all of us in this issue. Everyone is affected this in the United States, not just Texas. So we had a, we had a president in office who uh, engaged with us regularly and wanted our opinion as to what to do, not just CBP, but he expanded that vision out into areas of Texas where we had never been a part of that, and yet we're dealing with it on the floor after they penetrate the border. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a tremendous listener. Um, you know, utmost respect for the man and, and, and the way he conducted business as far as um, working with law enforcement here in this country and to, to reduce crime, to reduce criminality. And that's, uh, that's, that's something I don't hear much. And getting back to what we're just about to see next week with the new administration, the fact is the Biden uh, administration is committed in their platform to reversing the use of 287G and similar programs that force, uh, you know, with local law enforcement. And I want to talk to you about that because he's also committed in writing to ending all agreements entered into, the, into by the Trump administration on cooperation, with, with, which are the ICE detainers that I want both of you to talk about. What happens when you end that cooperation? How important has that been? Well, you, well just think about what I, what I just said and the sheriff said. The president has made policies based on the men and women on the ground doing the job, which means Joe Biden's saying, I don't care what the experts think, I don't care what the people doing the job think, I'm gonna do it my way, which I think is very dangerous. But look, the left always says, when I was ICE director, ICE needs to concentrate on criminals, just the criminals, leave everybody else alone. Well, you can't say concentrate on criminals and lock us out of the jail. You can't have it both ways. And the 287G program, which I was very involved with, with instrumental in creating that program, it's a colorblind system. If I get arrested tonight in his county, I'm going through, through, I'm going through, I'm going through the same program everybody else goes. It's a colorblind system. Everybody gets arrested, gets interviewed. If you're in the country illegally, then, you're going, then the, the sheriff's deputy is going to process you, overseen by a nice supervisor, and you're going to be set up for removal. You're in the country illegally in violation of law. Now you've been arrested for another violation. You should, every sheriff in the nation, and I've, I've targeted sheriffs. I got a great sheriff here, but I went after sheriffs in this country. I've said it out loud. When you fail to cooperate with ICE, when you fail to let an ICE officer, a federal officer, into a jail, a taxpayer-funded jail, to enforce their law, you stop being a sheriff and you became a politician. Because the sheriff's job, number one job, is the safety and, and protection of his community. When you knowingly release a criminal alien back into the community, the data shows he's likely to reoffend in the very community he lives, the immigrant community. So I'm sick and tired of the sanctuary politicians say, well, we, we, we don't want 287G and we're a sanctuary city because we want to protect the immigrant community. We want victims and witnesses to feel free to work with police and come forward. That is a bunch of crap. ICE doesn't care about the victim and witness. We want the bad guy sitting in the jail. 
We want access to the jail. And I think the victim and witness of that crime would much rather we take this guy off the street than to release him back into the community where they're at. And what they don't understand, when you release the bad guy back in the community, not does he only reoffend in the community, so that makes put the immigrant community at greater risk of crime. ICE is forced now, instead of being in the jail and being safe in the jail because he's behind the wire, now we got to go to the community and find him. Which means when we do find him, he's probably going to be with others. Or we're going to find others in our pursuit of him. Which means you put the immigrant community at greater risk of ICE arrest. So, so far you put the immigrant community at greater risk of, of, of harm. You put the uh, immigrant community at greater risk of ICE arrest. What, what else do you do? You put the men and women of law enforcement at grave danger, right? And arresting a bad guy in a county jail where he has no weapons. Now you got to go arrest him on his turf where he has access to who knows what. And there's one more thing I'll say, and, I, and I've dared every politician to do this for, who believes in sanctuary city policies. Go to the immigrant community and ask them one simple question. Would you rather ice in your community or ice in your jail? What do they think you're going to say? Because most immigrants, whether illegal or legal, they're here to take care of their family, take care of their families. I get it. They don't want child predators wandering around their neighborhood. They don't want somebody who's been convicted 10 times of DUI driving through their neighborhood. They care about their families too. So sanctuary city policy and the justification handles is nothing but, it, it, it's a false narrative and it's just wrong. And I've been going around the country trying to explain what I just explained. That makes sense. That's the facts. That's the truth. Sheriff, can you add on, on the importance of how that, that has impacted uh, in recent years, the cooperation, these agreements. Uh, you, how many sheriffs in Texas are, are participating in the 287 g We're 26, 26. But uh, let me approach it this way, Ken, and for, the, and for the viewers here. Isn't it amazing that we have to ask a question on why we're not cooperating? As, pre as professional law enforcement in, in any state in this country, um, I don't understand how a law enforcement professional can say, I'm not going to cooperate with another federal law enforcement agency. Uh, I'm going to cooperate with DEA, BATF, uh, CBP, ICE, uh, simply because that's part of what I do. That's, that is our responsibility. That's what we took an oath to do. We're, we're a law enforcement agency. They are too. So I'm not picking and choosing what we're doing. This is what, what makes sanctuary cities uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, horrific policies that have ever been uh, proposed out here in, uh, to the American public. Um, my constituents in Jackson County, the 18 county corridor that we have, controlling, uh, doing the best job we can, uh, ranging from Clayborough County to, to Chambers County, there's 18 contiguous counties, not including Houston and Fort Bend, but those other 18 counties there have committed to do and uphold the law in every area that we can. So if it's, if it's a violation law and it involves criminality, then as a peace officer, I'm going to pick and choose who I'm going to work with about that. Um, so think about that. I mean, it's an in-depth question. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a question that where we are in, in the United States uh, with policies and politicians who, who at, the, at the ground level uh, is, is really disturbing. So if, yeah, if, if I could just give, sure. I want to give one yeah. clear example. Certainly listen, I want to give you one clear example of what I was talking about, what the sheriff's talking about. Last year, Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of D.C., nine rapes in two months, committed by nine illegal aliens that could have been arrested in jail but were released. Eight of the victims were immigrants. Tell me how that sheriff and that commissioner protected the immigrant community. That is just one example, and there's thousands of them, but that is just, that is one that really tugged at my heartstrings just last year, and, and I went, you know, I went out there and I talked about it and did a lot of interviews on it, but that's the type of danger sanctuary city policies do to the, to the, to the people of the, of the community. How do you answer the critics that say, we'll cooperate, but only with a judge's warrant? Let me answer that, because that, that, that's another false narrative. <laughs> because Congress, when they wrote the Immigration Nationality Act, there's no process to get a criminal warrant. It doesn't exist. The law clearly states immigration officers have a right to present an administrative warrant mostly because they're likely to flee if, if they're not in a jail setting. So the law is clear. Congress has wrote the law, they enacted the law, the president signed the law. There's no need for a criminal warrant. So that's their way out of it. See, they, they, want, they want to sh sh send out the smoke and mirrors. Well, ICE can go simply get a criminal warrant. They could, if they want to prosecute, 
400,000 people a year, because that's about what runs through their system. But the Congress didn't intend for that. Congress set up a system for administrative warrants. That's the way the law reads. And I've said many times when people say that, talk to your lawyer, talk to your attorney general, or talk to your county attorney, and have them read the INA and explain it to you. Because that's not the way the law is set up. They don't need a criminal warrant. And uh, that, you know, the Second Circuit in Texas just last year found that to be constitutional. There's other districts, of course, Ninth Circuit, who said it wasn't. It needs to get to a higher court for, for a final uh, uh, judgment on it so we can, we can put this to bed. Sheriff, uh, another thing, that, and it seems to be a contradiction that Tom alluded to, that uh, the President Biden, or President-elect Biden, is committed to directing enforcement efforts towards threats to public safety, focus on the threats to public safety. Has that been what the Trump administration has been doing? Uh, to what extent has that been the focus already? And how can you focus on enforcing threats to public safety if you don't have that cooperation, right? Well, the vision from President Trump was, was so broad and, and uh, uh, definitive that that's exactly what we do. The actions he took resulted in increased border security on the things that we had been asking to be done. The, uh, from the partnerships where we're engaging more and more people, because again, we can't do this alone. CBP can't do this, ICE can't do this alone. It's got to be a team effort because it affects every nation, uh, every, every state, uh, and every county in this nation. So, you know, the, the perspective that he brought um, from us was an absolute border security solution that was, um, uh, you know, now uh, it, it possibly, and I hope this does not occur, uh, and I hope that we're engaged in, in, uh, with the Biden administration to, uh, to do everything we can to maintain strong border security here in our country. Um, I, you know, I have that hope. Uh, I have that, uh, if I get that invitation to be a part of those conversations that go along with that because I'm very adamant about uh, where we are now and where, where what we're hearing um, or the policies that we're hearing are clearly detrimental to what we've been doing. So it's gonna be interesting to see, Ken, uh, Tom, uh, exactly where we go. Now, another commitment that the administration that's coming in has made is to end private detention. And what does that do to our <laughs> enforcement capacity and the impact of ending private detention, Tom? It pretty much shuts down immigration enforcement. 88% of ICE detainees are in private detention facilities. Why? Because they do it cheaper, they do it better. And that's just a fact. When I was the ICE director, my most expensive beds are the ones the U.S. government owns. That goes with everything. Government, the federal government don't do anything cheap. So we, we hire people, you know, like these companies out there build, not just for ICE, they build prisons for states and they build prisons for counties. They do it and they do it well. And, and so if they shut down private detention, then we're going to be, rather than detaining 52,000, we're going to be detaining 12,000. So 100,000 people come across the border illegally during any surge, we'll be, we'll, our beds will be full in a day. So what do you do with everybody else? Catch and release. We're back to catch and release again. In private detention facilities, when, and, and the sheriff will tell you this, when I was the ICE director, I can't tell you how many sheriffs will walk up to me and say, I can't contract with you because your detention standards are too high. If I don't give that kind of detention standards to U.S. citizens, why am I going to give it to somebody that's in the country illegally? Because the ICE detention, and anybody can go to the ICE website and look up PBNDS 11, uh, uh, pre-decisional based detention standards. It's, it's, if you look at those standards, you're going to realize what great standards ICE has. They have higher standards than any county, state, or federal facility in the country. Compare it to any state or federal facility, I dare you and look at the detention standards. That's another false narrative you hear about how terrible ICE detention is. PBNDS 11 is, is, is beyond the pale, and it's very expensive. I mean, I think when I was ICE director, we spent 1.9 billion alone on, 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 detain, on detention. But it, it's, the standards are high, they do it good, they do it cheaper, it, 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 you, they do it better than anybody. And that's why, that's why we hire them, because, it's, because of budget concerns. So if we shut down private detention, it's gonna happen. And you can't build federal facilities fast enough. So it's back to catch and release. And, 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 and what people don't understand, catch and release, they say, well, rather than detention beds, we'll use ankle bracelets or we'll use alternative detention call in to check in. 98% of everybody ICE removes, they remove from a bed. 
Two years ago, they removed 267,000 people. You know how many were, you know how many were not detained? 3,100. Once they're released, they're in the wind. That's why we have 12 to 20 million illegal aliens in this country. A lot of them are fugitives. Right now, I think there's over 3 million fugitives. People have due process in this country, been ordered removed by a judge, but just didn't leave. And they didn't leave because they weren't being detained. And when you're on non-detained dock, it takes 45 years to go through the immigration case. If you're detained, the average length of detention is 38 days. Actually, there's a new study out that the outgoing Trump administration just released that we were discussing with you, uh, actually with, with other members of our border security coalition. Tom is a member, but, and, and a sheriff was gonna be with us that, the other day, but he was with the president. But we were actually analyzing at TPPF the new report looking at the outcomes of when someone is detained and how they typically are repatriated. They're sent back to their home country. And those who are caught and released typically do not end up being sent back to their home country. In a nutshell, that's, that's the, the major finding. And, and, and a clear example that's important, you hear about family detention, how terrible it is. The, uh, the president wants to detain families indefinitely. Under Obama administration, when the family surges first happened, we built t family detention centers. We detained them for about 40 days. That's how long it took to see a judge. And guess what? 94% of them were immediately deported because the judge says you don't qualify. Then a, a judge in the Ninth Circuit, Dolly G, I'll never forget her name, she said, no, you can't hold them, you can't hold them that long. I don't give you 20 days. Well, you can't, that's not time to see a judge. You got 20 days. So what happens? They get released. 300,000 families enter the country illegally in the last five years. Less than 1% have, been, have left because they're not detained. And that just, that's, that's just another enticement for more people to come because they know that we've shown as a country, you hang out in this country long enough, illegally, we're going to reward you. We're going to give you amnesty, we're going to give you a docker, or we're going to give you something else. That's why, and, and the number one complaint I got in my structure was, why did you arrest that guy? Uh, he's got three USC kids. Because he was, he was order removed 10 years ago, he went in hiding, he chose himself to have three kids. So now all of a sudden, he, so he, is he immune to our laws? The federal judge's order means nothing because he had a child? I feel bad for the children, I feel bad for that he made that decision. But that is what happens when you don't detain, they build equities, they have children, then everybody's against you and you want to remove them. It's, it's just, it's, there's no upside to that. I know Sheriff has to leave in a moment. Uh, Sheriff, would you have a final thought, especially because we don't have our state representative with us, what can the state do? What would you recommend is, are the things that the state can be doing in the absence of, of a federal uh, commitment? Thank you, Ken, and I, and I do have to leave. This, is, this sums up what, uh, what I believe is gonna happen here. If, if these policies are enacted uh, that uh, incoming president like Biden is talking about, uh, weakening the border uh, in any way, form, or fashion with all of these methods that are being talked about today will increase crime here in Texas and the United States. That's what that's what will happen here whenever we, we go through these. And we've already been there. We have already experienced these weakening of the border and what that does and what outcomes that we have, and they're all negative about that. So. Uh, what can the state do? Uh, what I want the state to do, uh, you know, I want a unified response from the state government here. Uh, I want total cooperation with as many law enforcement agencies as we can have here in the state of Texas to, as a group of professional law enforcement officers here in the state of Texas, that we work with every federal agency in order to combat crime here in the state. That's what we should be doing. Thank you, Sheriff, for being with us today. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'll see you back. And we're going to switch uh, with Sheriff leaving. We'll bring in Josh Jones in a few minutes, but we'll return to Tom Homan for the moment. Uh, Tom, another thing that we've heard in the past is um, actually just until 2019 when the caravans started coming in, it was hard to deny that we had a crisis. But just up until fall of 2018 or so, people were still saying the border is, is more secure than ever before, uh, that crime in our border region is less than in other parts of the U.S. How do you respond to that? How, how seriously uh, secure is, has the border been, or how dangerous really is it, the region? It's, it's very dangerous, but crime fluctuates on the on border communities because most of them, when they enter the country illegally, they don't stay in the border region. They're going to the big cities. They're going to sanctuary cities, right? They're going, if you're going to come to this country illegally and you want to work, and not be uh, uh, har harassed by ICE, you're gonna go to places that 
they don't cooperate ice. You can go to New York, you can go to Chicago, you can go to LA, you can go, any, you can go anywhere, it's California. But uh, they usually go to big cities for more opportunities or they may go to produce fields. But the border under President Trump's more secure than it's ever been because you've got 450 miles of wall. And because of his Title 42 uh, order and because of the Remain in Mexico program, the men and women of the Border Patrol are no longer changing diapers or making hospital runs or b making baby formula. I'm not, I don't mean that lightly either, because during the last surge, Border Patrol came out and they said 50 to 60 percent of Border Patrol, Border Patrol agents are no longer on the line. They were taking care of these family units, which is a humanitarian concern. You got to do it. I get it. But why did the president declare a national emergency? Why did he, why did he push the Remain in Mexico program? Because the president, like myself, recognized that humanitarian issues quickly become a national security issue. When half the border patrol is not on the line, the, you got to understand the intelligence clearly shows that c criminal cartels in Mexico control the northern border of Mexico. Nothing happens on that border without paying the plaza fees to the cartels. They manage everything. They'll send 200 family groups here, and they'll, and they'll time it. Send them here at this time. And while they tie up all the Border Patrol assets over there, that's when the fentanyl comes, and that's when the gang members come, and that's when the people that don't want to get caught come. So what happened during the family surge when hundreds of thousands of families came across that border and half the Border Patrol agents were tied up? 62,000 Americans died of fentanyl overdoses that came across that southern border. And President Trump recognized this humanitarian issue became a national security, it's not because the drugs were smuggled in, because if you're someone in this country who wants to do us harm, you want to come here and blow something up. You can't get a plane ticket anymore. It's very hard because all the database checks done after 9-11 to get a plane ticket to come to this country. If there's any derogatory information on you, you're not getting a plane ticket. It's hard to get a visa because the visa security unit run by ICE and CBP. You go through so many database checks, if there's any derogatory information from DOD, uh, uh, foreign governments, you're not getting a visa. So how are you going to come? Do us harm. You're going to come to the southwest border the way 20 million others did, especially when the borders got 50% of the border agents on the line. So the president realized this humanitarian issue is now a national security issue. I must do something. And that's when he took action. We have Josh Jones joining us. Josh is our new senior fellow in border security at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Josh has 18 years experience at the US Department of Justice as an attorney, prosecutor. Um, we'll be focusing actually on the other side of the border. And, and I think Josh's first question based on what's going on right now is Tom was saying, President Trump actually got Mexico, actually the cooperation on border security was more from Mexico than from his own United States Congress. And Mexico has been cooperating. Is that going to continue? Uh, the trend right now in, in Mexico from a political standpoint is, is, is away from cooperation with, 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 the, with the U.S. government. The, the uh, Congress down there recently in, in December passed legislation that effectively uh, uh, means that, that the DA down, down there can't do their jobs anymore. Uh, and, and, and they did this, uh, you know, as, as obviously we're, we're in transition politically here, so I think that gives them a political opportunity. Uh, obviously it happened after the, the election in November, so I, I think they, they saw and they still see uh, the opportunity to, uh, to, to be very aggressive uh, toward the United States in terms of, in terms of policy. Uh, the reality of uh, the state of Mexico is that it's, it's very much a failing state. Uh, it's, it's a state that, that politically uh, and economically is, is in crisis. And it's not a state that the United States should be dealing with on, on, evil, you know, on even terms, you know, as, as, as if it's, it's a give and take. Uh, they, they don't patrol their border at all. Uh, they uh, played along with Trump for four years, and, and we can see that, uh, as, particularly on the south side in Chiapas at the border with, with, with Guatemala. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think the trend uh, with the government of Mexico is, 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 is one that is toward uh, uh, almost trying to bully us in, in, in terms of uh, for, from a policy standpoint, and, and I, I don't see that in, uh, ending anytime soon. How about with but, the but central? You, go ahead, Tom. But you know what's really sad about that, and I agree with everything you just said, is that Mexico done more for us to secure our border than our own Congress. And regardless of what President Biden will do, it wouldn't have that tremendous effect on us if his Congress would have did their job the last four or five years and closed the three loopholes we've been begging them to close. I've been up on Hill numerous times. 
you probably might see me testify it's on YouTube. I've raised, you know, I lost my temper a few times mm -hmm. because they haven't seen what I've seen in my 34 years, and they can fix this. There's three loopholes with families. If they change the floor settlement agreement, let us detain them long enough to see a judge. If they're really escaping fear and persecution, there's nothing wrong with being in a family detention center. It's not a jail. It's a campus subsiding. Let us hold them for about 40 days and see a judge and plead their case. 90% will lose and we can deport them. As far as the, as far as the, the asylum claims, 89% of Central Americans that claim asylum, I said this earlier, never get relief from the government because they don't qualify. Unfortunately, domestic violence and poverty don't qualify for asylum. If Congress wants to do that, then change the law. But that's the way it's written. But when you're at the border, the threshold is very low to claim asylum. You just got to say a few key phrases that the cartels teach them, then they're released in the United States. Then when they get to immigration court, first of all, 49% never go to immigration court. The one 51% that go to immigration court, the threshold is much higher to prove fear from your, from your home government. Asylum is fear from your home government for, for your race, religion, uh, political affiliations, social groups. So when they get in front of the judge, most of them lose. So, but they're already in the United States, so they're in the wind. So what I've asked Congress to do a hundred times, take that first interview and move, get that threshold that makes a little more sense in that first interview, right? That makes sense. And they can fix those loopholes. The final loophole is the kids. The Trafficking Victim Protection Act has, it was a great thing to try to identify victims of trafficking, but it's been abused. If you're a child from Mexico and you get interviewed by the Border Patrol and you're not a victim of trafficking, you're removed within five hours back to the authorities in Mexico. If you're from Central America, you're not removed. You get a whole different process. And all we're asking them to do is look at the TV I pray, treat the children from Central America the way you treat children from Mexico. Those three loopholes, President Biden can do what he wants. The, the border would still surge, but nowhere is near the level it's going to because Congress had failed to close the loopholes. The permanent fix is not there. So regardless of everything President Trump did, once that policy go away, we're back to, we're back to you know, ground zero because Congress has failed the American people to secure the border. And there, the, it's very interesting that there is legislation that Lindsey Graham and Henry Cuellar in South Texas co-sponsored co -sponsored to deal with that loophole on the unaccompanied children from Central America, but uh, Congress has failed to act on that. Even a bipartisan fix uh, failed to get support from other members of, of uh, Henry Cuellar's caucus, obviously, uh, in the House. But, um, but there are solutions. They're not that uh, difficult to identify, and they're actually in bills in Congress. Uh, in which, is, in which is why I get angry. Which, you know, people say, why do you get emotional on Fox News? Why do you get emotional in front of Congress? Because I've seen terrible things in my, my career that I'll never forget that still affect me to this day. So when Congress sits there and accuse me of not caring about dying children, I said, white. You know, wear my shoes. You know, I was in the back of the trailer, 19 dead immigrants that suffocated death, and a five-year-old boy that suffocated in the father's arms. I had a five-year-old son at the time. I didn't sleep for a week. I mean, they haven't seen what I've seen. So every time they want to accuse Border Patrol of killing people or people dying in the custody of Border Patrol, and ICE, you know what? Look in the mirror. Because you are enticing these people to make that dangerous journey. You, 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 and the cartels are, are, taking, are taking advantage of these vulnerable people. Putting through, look, 31% of women that go to that trafficking pattern get sexually assaulted. That's not my number. That's Doctor Without Borders number. 31% get sexually assaulted. Children die. Thousands, Border Patrol saved 4,000 people last year from drowning in the river or dying in the desert because they were lost because the smugglers left them to die. Because once they get sick, they're not going to call for help because they're not worth anything anymore because once he gets them where he goes to go, he's not going to get paid. So that is, that is the crux of the immigration issue. You need to force Congress to fix it. They can. It's easy. There's three loopholes. Fix it. And secure the, there's no downside in a secure border. I want someone to tell me, what's the downside on less illegal immigration? What's the downside on less illegal drug flow? What's the downside, downside of taking millions of dollars out of cartels' hands? What's the downside of saving lives? What's the downside of burying one less border patrol agent? That's why I get emotional about this issue. And that's why I try, that's why when you ask me to come or I jump at it, because I'm pissed. Because Congress isn't doing their job. Uh, again, trying to look for some hopeful scenario, uh, President-elect Biden is committed in his platform uh, to investing in better technology, coupled with uh, prote privacy protections, but better technology at and between ports of entry, including cameras, sensors, large-scale x-ray machines, fixed towers. Is the technology 
enough? Uh, is that something that we can expect to pressure to see him uh, fulfill that commitment? Yes, Josh. If, if there's one thing that we can do better in terms of technology on the border, it's in tunnel detection. The, the, the two most prevalent ways of moving drugs and illegal persons across the border and bulk cash back are tunnels and just straight through the ports where, where they usually buy off a, a CDP agent and, and control a lane for a day. Uh, one of those is corruption and, and the other is, is, is our, our, our tunnels. And uh, I, I think uh, that's a solvable problem. You know, it's 2021, we, we should be able to detect tunnels running across our border. Uh, and particularly with the, with the Sinaloan uh, drug traffickers, that's, that's how they do it. That's how they love to do it. That's how they've done it for 20 years. Uh, going back to Shapo in, in the 1990s when he sort of pioneered it. So uh, tunnel detection is something we, we, we just, we don't do well. I mean, in, when I was a prosecutor in San Diego, we, we'd, we'd hit a tunnel every year or two, and it, it would be a huge celebration because you'd find a lot of drugs down there, but the reality is for every one we hit, there are probably 50 that, w that we, we just don't know where they are. So uh, I, I think from a technology standpoint, I, I think a major investment should be made on the U.S. law enforcement side in, in tunnel detection. I agree. Technology is great, and it's, it is improving, but technology don't arrest people. I'll say that. Um, and, and, you know, you know who voted for border barriers in 2006? Joe Biden, uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Chuck Schumer, all voted for border barriers. In they, voted, they voted for walls in 2006 because they know they work. But he wants, to, he wants to stop building this wall or possibly tear it down, not realizing this wall is not only the same wall, a wall that he voted for in 2006, it's a better wall because of technology. This new wall has sensor technology. If someone touches that wall, Border Patrol's going to know. If someone tries to dig under that wall, Border Patrol's going to know. If someone climbs that wall, Border Patrol's going to know. So it's a smart wall. It's a smart wall system, first of all. And as far as the POEs, the, the, another false narrative is, you know, the Congress, they want to put all the money in the, in the POEs. Why? Because they want, to, they want to speed up trade. Because it's money. Chamber of Commerce, it's money. It's not about enforcement. Why, why is most drugs seized at the port of entry? Because every vehicle stops, for God's sake. If I'm a smuggler, I'm a smuggler 100 kilo, kilos of coke, when I go through a port of entry, I know someone's going to stop and talk to me. And he's going to try to, you know, sniff out something suspicion. I may be secondary or not. I may get lucky and go through. So when they say more drugs are smuggled through the port of entry, no, more drugs are seized at a port of entry. We don't know what we don't know. I'm going to ask one more question before I ask any audience members to think of a question, whether you're here uh, present in this room or in 105 in our other room. Uh, think of any question for Tom or Josh that we can discuss. Uh, and at that time, you, you know, we'll, we'll recognize you. We have some with a mic in both rooms that will go up to you. you. Just raise your hand. But I will ask one more question related to the problem of corruption uh, of agents. And to what extent is that a real problem are federal agents uh, and um, at the border, at these ports of entry? Um, Josh, is this something we should be looking at? Is it happening? Tom, did, that, did, did you run across that? I know we're basically talking about CBP agents. And Tom, you were in the enforcement. But with all the experience, I know you can comment on that as well. Look, I've seen cases where there's been corruption, uh, and they need to be held accountable because they, they're, they're, they're a shame on the badge. Men and women of CBP, Border Patrol ICE, they, they, they put a badge, a badge on their chest and gun on their hip every day to put their lives on line for this country, and they're dishonored by anybody that's corrupt. It happens. But I'll say this, it doesn't happen as much as it does south of the border. And the, maybe you can expand on this because I, I, I don't know. The, all of it, but Mexico just changed a lot of laws down there where now they're going to, you know, the Drug Enforcement Administration has to show them all intelligence gathered in Mexico and, and they're, they're really hampering drug enforcement efforts. And we can't share all the intelligence with the government of Mexico because some intelligence we're just not going to share because we don't trust them. And I, you know, I know this, I know this firsthand. I've seen it when I was a border patrol agent. I've seen the corruption on the southern border. So when, when, the, when, the when the president of Mexico is going to change laws, he's got to understand he's got a corruption in his military, he's got a corruption in his, in, his, in his law enforcement, especially the federal police. Not all of them are. There's a lot of men and women down there that want to serve the, Mexico and do the right thing, but there's a lot of corruption down there, which is out, out of control. And he knows that better than anybody. So even though there's a corruption in the U.S., I think there, there's been a lot of focus on it. CBP just had a huge study with 
the IG coming in, and I'll say it once again, there is corruption. I don't think it's a lot, but one's too many because it puts lives at risk. Anything, Josh? I absolutely agree. In, in Mexico, corruption is not a problem. Corruption is the problem, and it's systemic on every level of government. Uh, and, and just to the corruption issue on, on our side, uh, it, it's, it's a math game. Uh, you know, if, if a cartel wants to, wants to move dope through a, a lane in a port, uh, they drop a you know, half a million dollars in, in the pocket of a, of a U.S. agent, and you know, it's, it, it happens. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's unfortunate, but even like I, I have done DEA, HSI cases where we have proactive agents doing, doing work in Mexico, and we, we even have to you know, look out then and, and, and make sure and, and double check, because there's, there's a lot of it, uh, particularly in the Valley uh, area of, of Texas. Uh, it, it's not really systemic on, on the U.S. side, but it is there, and, and it's, it's a huge, huge problem. The, 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 the units we work with in Mexico and Central America, all around the world, we, we're in 42 different countries, but we have vetted units. And law enforcement that joins the task force we're a part of in foreign countries, especially Mexico, we vet them ourselves. So we make sure, we, we go through their financials, we, we, we'll, know, we'll know everything about that person before we accept them and train them to be part of the vetted unit. But anybody outside that vetted unit, you, you gotta watch what you, what you tell them. And that's just, that's just a fact. You, you, you just assume they are and can go from there. Uh, actually, I'm going to take the privilege of one more question related to President-elect Biden's appointee of, um, of Secretary of DHS, uh, Mayorkas. Um, and this is for Tom. Uh, what should we be looking for? There were concerns in the past when he, under the Obama administration, was uh, uh, trying to get through a fight for his confirmation. Are we going to see objections to his uh, appointment? I will think you see objections. Let me say this about... Ali Mayorkas. Uh, I worked for him before. He was the Deputy Secretary of Jay Johnson. And I've said it in a lot of interviews, took a lot of heat for it. I respected Jay Johnson. We didn't agree on a lot. Uh, we agreed on some things. But J Ali Mayorkas was like Jay Johnson. If there, was some, if there was a policy they were thinking of, the Obama administration was thinking of, or some sort of action they think about taking, they'd bring me to the table. They'd bring me and the head of board to the table and say, here's what we're thinking about doing. What do you think? And we give them a stone cold truth. Here's what we think. Is it bad? Is it good? Here's what the results will be. Sometimes we're able to focus, you know, change their decision or, or, or map it out a little bit differently. Sometimes we didn't. But I respected my, uh, Ali Mayorkas because he gave us a seat at the table. There's no surprises. He wanted to hear, if we do this, what's the blowback? What's going to happen? And they listen. So, look, and, and me and Mr. Mayorkas didn't agree on a lot of immigration, but we agreed on some things. So I respect the man because he wants to hear the opinions before he makes a decision. I will say he's, a, he's an immigrant himself, came to Cuba. He, I think he's a great American. I think he loves his country. And, you know, I'm going to hold out hope. And I think he will come and, and listen to the men and women of the Border Patrol and ICE and, and before he makes decisions, hopefully take their you know, opinions to heart because he did it with me. So I, I'll give him... I'll support him until he gives him reason not to, I, but I think he's a great American. I think he loves this country. We'll see what happens. We have a lot uh, of content we've covered in this, uh, in less than an hour. Less than an hour. Uh, uh, I would just ask if you have a question to raise your hand and, um, and identify yourself by name and organization or affiliation and, um, and make sure that you end with an actual question. Is there, are there any questions for our guests? Yes, sir. Over here. Mark Skinner, Wait, sir. I have a, I have a, Mark Skinner, Mark Colleague Skinner, Texas. Colleague Texas. Of the border, of the states, border states, two questions. Two questions. Which, which, where's the problem, where's the, problem the, worst? the worst? And in Texas, and in Texas if we do if have we a problem, have a with, problem the with the federal bureaucracy unwilling to support border security, what can the state of Texas do legislatively to enhance border security? Josh, you want to hand I, on Tom? I, I, I can answer the first part of that. I just spent the last six years in San Diego uh, working in the U.S. Attorney's Office out there, so I, I've dealt with drugs coming across the border, uh, um, immigration issues in, in that state. The, the port there is in San Ysidro. It's the largest land port in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, I, I don't know how many number of lanes there are, but it's, it, it's a huge port and uh, a, a huge number of, of, of vehicles cross it every day and a huge number of, of foot traffic goes across it every day. Uh, I, I, I think uh, 
the, the most dangerous city on earth right now, statistically, is Tijuana. And the reason it is, is it's, it's disputed territory between the Sinaloa cartel and, and the, the uh, CJNG, the New Jalisco cartel. And, uh, uh, and, and the reason for that is that, that that port is probably the best port to move either drugs or, 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 or humans across, just because of the volume that comes through. Um, and Texas is a little bit different, and, 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 and you're probably more familiar than I, than I am, but I believe there are about 10 or 12 different ports along the Texas border. So you have smaller traffic. I, I, I know Juarez is similar to uh, Tijuana in terms of that at one point, and it may still be the, the port that where the most drugs actually come across. Uh, but I, I think sm sm smaller ports give you more control over what's coming through. And so from my, my guess in, in working some in both Texas, uh, some in Arizona, some in California, is, is that San Isidro Port's probably uh, the biggest problem that we have. Uh, but then in, in Texas, we have the problem of, of having to deal with the 10 or 12 uh, different ports along the border. Would, I agree 100% when it comes to narcotics smuggling, but illegal immigration, if Joe Biden keeps his promises, every state's got a problem. Every state, they don't have, a, where there's not a wall structure. And, I, and I, for example, San Diego, I was Border Patrol agent in San Diego sector. I was in Campo. But as a GS-5 uh, Border Patrol agent, you got to work six and seven day overtime just to pay rent. So I used to work six day overtime on the soccer fields down the Chula Vista. And, that, and every night on the soccer fields, just north of Tijuana, they'd gather up. And Border Patrol agents gathered up. Soon the sun went down, the race was on. We'd rest 1,000, 1,200 a shift. Once they built that border barrier, 20, 30. It's, so the problem is going to be where there's not a wall as far as mass surges of uh, illegal aliens. And that's going to happen in every state if, if he keeps the promises he made. Because, like I said, the cartels are in the human trafficking organization are already tra mapping out the transportation infrastructure, where they're going to move people to. And what's going to happen once they, they surge people through, like I said, they're going to do the same thing they did the last time. The cartels are going to control where they go and when they go so they can do things in unguarded parts of the border. The great thing about what President Trump has accomplished with 450 miles of wall, walls don't stop people. Walls slow people down. Most people can't climb that wall. Have you ever seen it? You, you, most people can't climb it. But it funnels people to an area where less border patrol agents can. It's an efficiency thing. Less border patrol agents can do the job. So it's going to make their job a little bit easier. There's going to be less gotaways, less gotaways of illegal aliens, less gotaways of smuggled drugs between the ports of entry. So every state will see a problem, but where there's not a border barrier, you're going to see the biggest problems. We have some folks in the other uh, room. If you'd like to ask a question, just feel free to stand up and come up to the mic. If not, uh, we'll go to the next question within this room. If there's anyone else that would like to raise their hand with a question or comment, uh, well, preferably a question, right, for our panelists. Yes. Yeah, I'll ask a question. Oh. Um, I'm just a moment. Hand. Just for the mic. Oh, oh well, I can talk loud. But, um, my name is Paul Hartman, and I'm a vision and a supporter of um, your foundation, which is a wonderful addition to the nation. But anyway, my question is, if you can um, correct problems with laws, and I agree with you, it doesn't take much. It takes some guts to create the law. And really, it doesn't take that. It, it takes patriot feelings to create the laws. But anyways, can you envision, if we did that and corrected our issues on this side of the border, could you envision a country in Mexico that would be more people oriented and go after the cartel and clean up that cesspool down there? My opinion is Mexico is bought and paid for. Cartels run Mexico. They, they, they just, there's just too much money. When a police officer in Tijuana makes, you know, $80 a week, you know, it's in, then you got a cartel member just offering him a thousand, turn his head away the other way. Like you say, there's customs officers. You know, all all, all they have to do is make a half million dollars. It's not secondary that car. He'll be told there's going to be a black Cadillac with this place plate number coming to at your shift. All we're asking you to do is talk like you normally do, but secondary the next car. Just don't secondary him. Don't have anything suspicious. Let him go. That's the problem. Money. We we got less of a problem here, but Mexico. The cartels control Mexico. Cartels have bought military leaders. They have bought federal police. They have bought police chiefs. They bought high, uh, high levels, you know, uh, senior members of the political parties. It's just Mexico's, it, Mexico's in trouble. 
Josh? I, I absolutely yeah. agree. I, I think it's, it's, it's maybe even worse in that the political establishment there is, is arguably the largest drug cartel in the world. In the sense that they regulate, they profit off the, the, the drug trade, uh, they protect people that, I mean, we, we, the highest level of drug traffickers in Mexico right now, most of them, we, we can point to the, to the hut that they're in on a GPS you know, map and we can't get the Mexicans out to arrest them because they're protected. Uh, the, the, the corruption problem in, in Mexico is far worse than, than, than anyone on this side of the border who, who hasn't seen it directly uh, is, is aware of. Are we seeing, uh, yes, I'm sorry, do we have any other question in this audience? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, so I've been reading books by Sarah Cortez who writes. Oh, just a moment. Can I have a yeah. speak in the mic? Just sorry, for yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm echoing over there. Um, I've been reading some books by, edited by Sarah Cortez who writes extensively about the south of the border and just north of the border and as a police officer and as a, as a researcher and she, talks a lot about the cartels moving into southern Texas and the other southern states. Maybe you discussed this before I got in the room. I'm sorry for being late. But how are you, how, to what degree are you seeing this moving into our country? And to what degree do you see this as becoming a really serious problem here as it has continued to move south of the border into those da really dangerous areas in the triangle under, below the border? Josh. I, I don't think that there's any, any designs on the part of transnational criminal organizations to take territory in the United States because they're, they're businessmen. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not thugs. They're, they're for most, some of them are paramilitary, but they're, they, they, they're, they're smart enough to know that if they take on the U.S. government, that they're going to get wiped out. So they're smart enough to stay in, the, in, in their, in their you know, territory and, and fight amongst themselves for the territory. Uh, but I, I don't think there's a threat of them moving into any, in any part of the United States uh, to take territory. Now, there is a threat of, of, of violence just south of the border, which is horrific, spilling over in, in, into towns in, in, in the United States just across the border, like Nuevo Laredo or, or just going to Brownsville, McAllen. I, I think that's a, there's a significant uh, uh, likelihood of, of that as, as, as things go on. Know, as, as they are. Tom, did you see that? Um, yeah, you know, they're, they're protected in Mexico. They're not gonna come up. Have they been up here? Yeah, do that, is there cross-border crime? Yeah, but do they do a lot of operations up here? No, because most law, American law enforcement can't be purchased. In Mexico, they're safe. They got paid protection. So, uh, any final thoughts uh, that you can say we should be focused on going forward, uh, both Josh and Tom, of all that we've covered, uh, maybe the, the essence of what we should be looking for and, and doing to, to support border security going forward. I want to end with this. You know, I, I kind of hit on earlier, you know, you've all seen me. I get mad. I get irritated. I yell and scream. But I've seen a lot of terrible things in 34 years. I've, I've, you know, I've carried dying children. I've carried dead children that I found. I've, I've, I've talked to women that's been raped. You know, numerous times, one little girl, 22 different DNA in her. Uh, when you see that what I've seen in my 34 years, you get angry that the, the Congress is ignoring this issue. It's a huge issue. When you see uh, someone's here illegally working in the kitchen, you know, sending money home, you think that's all good. And I understand, you know, I, I understand his need to support his family. But what people don't see is the underground. They don't see that there's, there's a flip side of this whole story of the criminal cartels. And you know, criminal cartels are making millions of dollars. The same cartels are murdered border patrol agents, DEA agents, right? I already tell you, 31% of women are getting raped, children are dying. The most vulnerable people in the world are being, you know, at the hands of the cartels. And they'll say, "Get to the United States, we'll get you a green card." There's no green card here, here waiting for them. So, you know, you, illegal immigration is not a victimless crime. It isn't. You see someone working illegally. They, if they stole someone's social security number, my wife had it happen to her. We're buying a new house, all of a sudden said, well, you didn't pay your uh, electric bills. Someone took her social security number in Fort Worth, Texas, was using it. And it took us a long time, a lot of money to fix that. So look, when, when you see, when the media went after ICE for doing these big raids at the meat plants. But what they didn't say, there was over 100 victims of identity theft. Social security numbers were stolen. People's, people's credit ratings got destroyed. No one hires an illegal alien out of goodness of the heart. They hire them because they can work them harder, pay them less, and undercut their competition. 
I just had a roof, roof replace my house. I had to call five different companies so I got a company to guarantee me legal workforce. And the guy that showed up was a father and a son who used to employ 30 U.S. citizens. He says, just me and my son. No, I can't compete with the companies that aren't legal aliens. I had U.S. citizens paying like 25 bucks an hour. They're paying these guys five bucks an hour to be up in that roof all day. He said, I can't compete with that. So understand, illegal immigration is not a victimless crime. Now, can we deport 20 million people? Absolutely not. Something needs to be done. But Congress needs to step up and do their job. I'm so sick and tired of talking to those folks, and including some Republicans. Why are we fighting about E-Verify for decades? What's wrong with E-Verify? Right? That would stop a lot of this. If people can't come in to get a job, many of them are not going to come. So hold your congressman responsible. Write your letters. And I've said this, you know, and, and it's just not, you see what's going on in this country right now? It's just not Congress. You gotta get out there and vote for your school board, you gotta get out there and vote for your mayor, your city councilman, because it's we gotta we gotta take this country back. The America I grew up in, we're losing. Will you join me in thanking our panelists this afternoon?